Dr. All right, welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. As part of our work to promote play, we've introduced these Porch Play Chats, which are conversations on a variety of topics with folks who are just as passionate about play as we are. Um, you can find out all about Porch Play Chats and IPA USA by visiting our website at ipausa.org. Up in that little top right-hand corner, you'll find our links to our Facebook page, our Instagram, and our YouTube channel. And there's a Porch Play Chat released every Monday, both on Facebook and YouTube, and then also on our website. Just go to ipausa.org under advocacy, click on Porch Play Chats, and you'll see our three years of Porch Play Chats. And these are all free to you, so I hope you'll um, take advantage. So I'm Deb Lawrence, president of IPA USA. And with me on the porch is Lisa Murphy. Hi, Lisa. Hello, hello, hello. And with us today is Joanna Seymour Bridgeton. Joanna is an associate professor of childhood education at the Family Studies at Missouri State University. She's passionate about defending the rights of every child to play. She has been a past board member of IPA. And she's currently in her 15th year as a board member for the Association for the Study of Play. As a play teacher, researcher, she loves to talk about play. And today's topic is so important. It's play, our ethical responsibility. And I just love this because I don't think anybody's talked about this. And so we, we really have to delve deep into what that means. So Joanna, play and ethics, you don't typically hear those two words together. So can you give us some insight into that? Absolutely. Happy to do so. Um, because I am so passionate about play, this just automatic, automatically went, went together with me when I started teaching teachers and um, knowing the code of ethical conduct for NACI, it, it just, I'm like, if you know this, you can't not do it like that you have to follow it you know um the full principle you know nacy states that um there's one principle that has precedence over all the others okay and that full principle reads gotcha above all we shall not harm children we shall not participate in practices that are emotionally damaging physically harming disrespectful degrading dangerous, exploitative, or intimidating to children. Mm -hmm. And this principle has precedence over all others in this code. So that's the most important thing. And I maintain that much of the early childhood practices that are happening right now are harming children. Mm -hmm. Thus, they are unethical practices. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. 100%. I actually had started telling people during workshops that that it is an ethical issue when you choose my metaphor, as you guys know, is the house, right? If we start building that house of academics before paying attention to that rock solid foundation, you are not doing your job. And that is, an, in my world, that has become a real, I think even calling it out like that kind of makes people like, oh, ooh, ethical? Yes. Ethical? That's why I like it. Yeah, it gets attention. It well, gets you can, attention. And I think what's so beautiful about just having that opening statement, that one principle, it blown up in a college classroom or in an early childhood classroom and put on the wall that you can, people can talk about practices and you can say, does it meet the principle, right? Does it meet the principle? When you're talking about young children and you're talking about guidance strategies, is time out meeting young, that principle is, you know, what else could you do? And I think putting it in their face like that makes it more real than just reading it on a piece of paper, right? And so, it might force you to come to grips and to face the fact that what you've been saying for 20 years, you believe you really don't. Right, right. when faced with, hey, I never thought about it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. 
maybe have a light bulb moment that I didn't realize that light bulb moment, you know, Oprah, which also brings to mind one of the many things that I learned from Oprah. And this wasn't Oprah. It was, well, I heard it from Oprah, but when she, you know, the often quoted Maya Angelou quote, um, but when I used it in an article, I had to find where I actually heard it. heard it. And it was from Oprah on one of her shows, you know, you did then what you knew how to do. Now that you know better, you do better, right? That's the actual quote from Oprah talking what Maya said to her. And I feel that goes so strongly with what you're about to hear if you're listening to this porch chat. <laughs> you are now going to be responsible. And some people then shut the door, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I don't want to know, then I'm not, then I'm off the hook, right? I've had that experience when talking about play with playgrounds, talking with a group and I'm like, oh, these are the things you need to do to meet the whatever. And they just didn't have me back, <laughs> you know, cause they were going to be like, nope, we don't know those things. And yep. I kept waiting. I'm like, if they have an injury on that playground, it's on them, you know, but. Right. And because sometimes it's hard based on, based on all the baggage we bring with us. Sometimes it's hard to admit that we're wrong. Sometimes we're afraid because then we have to face that, ooh, maybe. Yeah, but I if you were honestly working something. from a place of not knowing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like right. you honestly right. didn't know, then we're gonna cut you some slack. But Absolutely. but it's when you Absolutely. hold on to it, mm -hmm. once you do know better, and and I want to even go back even like a few more more minutes is. I also think we need to be mindful of not making an assumption that everybody involved in early childhood has actually read that document. Right. Uh -huh. Well, it's dry. Oh, yeah. It's dry, right? Yeah. So like I created in my classes, I created a game. And so I would do that and use this game with the principals at presentations, conferences and things like that. And I'm all, I probably should get it like, cre I have like 10 of them created, but I should probably have them to purchase because all, people will go past class time and at the conferences they like i want to take this back to my group because it gets people really talking about the things that they we created all these certain topics that they were really interested in and it was kind of fun so like i've kind of enjoyed using ethics because i've used game <laughs> i've used play to it's teach fun. about ethics yeah right i yeah. I, have, yeah. I am truthful with this play is important so i used it to teach and i think what i noticed this last summer when i taught a graduate course on um the education will of play and these teachers um i would have them create these um lessons and and do them on video for all of us to see and um what i found out is they buy into it, but they don't know what it means. And so they don't know they, how to apply it, right? Right. That's they the understand theme. play. Yes. yes. They understand play is important, but they don't know then what to do with it. They're like, well, what do I do? And what I noticed is that some folks misinterpret what play means. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that I had a problem with the previous NACI guidelines of mm -hmm. DAP is that they didn't understand what actual play meant. So there's like play. So what I think should be happening in a classroom, play, actual play, playful teaching, and lots of recess, those three things. So it, it's not just one. So when I think of play and understanding that play is open ended, and, and students can discover things that part of play, and then being a playful teacher. So mm -hmm. here's where they kind of weren't sure what that meant. Um, either one of those things. And the, the thing that I saw happening a lot is that they would use do, okay, I'm gonna do hands-on. So I used materials, that means it's play. And I'm like, no, that means it's a good activity, but it's not play. And so they kind of go to the hands-on stuff. And so mm -hmm. I realized that was kind of a place to enter into really good conversations with people, them giving them a chance, let's try this out. Okay, this is where, and then that's where they would make the discovery for themselves because you can say everything <laughs> but they have to discover it themselves so there's some guidance so if teachers are unsure hey reach out to folks and say hey i want to is this play you know or is this playful teaching and maybe that's something we could talk about at another time but mm -hmm. i feel like that's where folks are like okay i get it great but what do i do yeah, next 
Yeah. Now what do I do? Because they yeah. haven't had the experience. We were talking about that on a couple of other porch play chats. It's that we're entering into a generation that may not have ever had unstructured play outside. Right. And so we have to give them opportunities to experience what that's like. So, you know, Before that's, they can go facilitate it for the children. Yeah. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm seeing. I don't know if that's what you're mm -hmm. seeing in your college classrooms, Joanna, but that's what I'm seeing that it is, it is alien to them. They, 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 they don't know what to do. They don't even know what it means because they haven't had the experiences. So I think that's, yep. that's what our role as educators is, is to give them and presenters is to give them those playful experiences so that they can then reflect on what what came out of that what how did that make me feel what what did I enjoy about that and then what could I do in my classroom to have other children be able to enjoy stuff that we're yeah. doing and you said part of that word is so important joy that's another thing that I like to talk about a lot mm -hmm. Who should be more joyful than little children? Right. Like there should be joy in your class. There should be joy throughout your day. It was so hard to stop teaching <laughs> little kids. Like I, I love research and I wanted to do research and, and, but I loved being a teacher of little ones so much. I got to enjoy so many things and share that excitement with them. I loved singing and dancing and playing instruments and going to art museums and create, like I got to do everything I loved every day. And we cooked, got to share all these experiences. Like I personally still cook eggs the same way I learned in preschool. Like, <laughs> like they taught me how to do it on, I literally make the same recipe. I do it. And you know, the, that's the fun part. And I was in the seventies. So I got to do, you know, woodworking and all of that. And so, and also I always did word work, woodworking with my, in my classrooms and nailing stuff back, and kids can use saws. Giving back well, what you received, right? Yeah. So of course you, you experienced something amazing. And so you were able to facilitate then those similar experiences for those kids. And, and I would imagine to some degree for both of you, it, it, it's almost heartbreaking to mm, some degree to see just like, oh my gosh, I, I'm so sorry you didn't get this. Yes. Uh -huh. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold that. And mm -hmm. I still am going to expect you to give it back. Right. <laughs> so yes. we, can do, we can do some backfilling over <laughs> here um, to, 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 to remedy that. But moving forward, there is a sense of expectation. And I think that circles back to the ethical piece is like, I'm sorry, you didn't get it. Um, but in this line of work, here is a code that guides us. And, and by not doing some of these things, right? Because I would argue that the absence of some things is just as quote unquote bad and unethical as the doing of some things that just should not be being done. Right, right. And I think I'm talking more about the absence. The absence. Uh -huh. The absence of play, playfulness and recess. I mean, let, I mean, let me just throw out some crazy stuff that might get you thinking about some of the ways that I, I'm saying were harmful. All right, you know, when I was a teacher, there might have been one child every three to four years who had an OT issue. Uh huh. Now they're in almost every classroom. Uh huh. Right? Fine motor develops after gross motor, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be doing lots of stuff, right? We've got to be outdoors, playing on, um, swinging, climbing, doing spinning, doing all of these things and to develop those fine motor, but, but kids aren't doing those things from like birth. Right. Uh -huh. But they also have the idea of anybody heard about container children, right? Mm -hmm. They're in these, they're in like little things that the kids sit in all the time and hold them up. Right. There you go. Instead but, of lying yeah, down and I, moving their bodies. I, I call those prison devices. Oh my goodness. That's what I call them that they're in prison because we're restricting their ability to move. But then we, why, we, then, we, then we get mad a couple of years later when they don't know how to hold a pencil. You're like, right. hello. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We yeah, and that prison happened. idea, prison is another thing. There's that prison pipeline, right? Uh -huh. 
Yeah. There is another <clears throat> issue with this ethics is that that lack of play, lack of physical movement with recess is also an equity issue. It's hurting certain children more, mm -hmm. you know? And so that African-American children are ne nearly four times more likely to be suspended. Um, they have this, there's a bias against these children. Even mm -hmm. if you don't think so, it's there. We oh, have studies so on that of teachers. Um, and even when there was no issue, teachers are seeing an issue like in this study. Um, and it, it's quite interesting, um, the work that's been done on that, but it's awful what's happening. So, um, when Joanna, I go back to what Peter Gray and, um, Stuart Brown are always saying in all their research on uh, individuals who committed murder had play deficits, right? That they right. had absolute play deficits in their childhood environments. Not That does not mean everybody who has a play deficit is going to be a murderer, but that was one of the contributing factors. And so one of the things I think would be really helpful to the Porch Play Chat folks is if you could send the research on that you've just been talking about it's, and I can, work. it's walter gilliam's work g-i-l-l-i-a-m <clears throat> yes. just for yes. the yale study yeah uh -huh. okay. yes so send send those so that people have the evidence that they need to understand that if if we are wanting every child to be successful and to reach the potential they were gifted at conception right so whatever that is that there are ethical responsibilities that we have as educators to, to give them what they need to be successful and to reach their potential. And that is not learning how to read at three. And that <laughs> well, right. And you know, what's interesting is that even if, okay, so we give all this evidence about physical and social, emotional and all that stuff about why it's important. And, but then it's like, okay, if you don't even care about any of that, because some people are like, yeah, but academics, right? Even academics are better when there's play and more recess. Uh -huh. You know, um, children, who, boys who have to sit still more, mm -hmm. read, are not as able to read. They mm -hmm. have a reading, like those, they show, a, uh, I can't remember the study. Correlation, I down yeah. There. But it was a correlation between <laughs> Kids, who, boys who weren't allowed to move. So boys need movement even more. So mm -hmm. you're saying, okay, you can't get this project done. Um, so you're going to stand for recent. You're actually making it harder for them, not just emotionally and socially, but cognitively. You're making it harder for them to do their work. Um, of course, we know they're actually making it harder. Well, maybe not every, but harder discipline wise. Um, when you have more recess, discipline issues go down because kids are getting what they need. It is a need. And that's why I think it's unethical. They need to play. They mm -hmm. need to be physical and they're not being physical outside of the classroom, right? right. So we're going and doing all these things. So if, if you restrict it, they're not they're getting not anywhere getting else. Anywhere. Right. right. So, well, but your day will be is, better as a teacher <clears throat> if you do these things. You're gonna and, have a and much they, better time. And they might get it outside of the classroom, but what they're getting is rule-based, right, right. soccer, softball, you know, oh, God forbid, you know, touch football, but they're getting it or ballet, right, or tap. They're getting it, which is not to say those are not good experiences, but they can't be the only experience and it should only be one at a time. Not, right. It's uh, structured. Gonna, yes. It's, we have to move away from thinking, oh, well, they're having recreation because they're going to ballet or they're going to soccer or they're going to yeah. softball. They spend a lot of time just standing around waiting, not actually yeah. really moving their bodies. Right? Yeah, exactly. I guess you and would it's, think it's, like, Okay, so is when you take a class, that hour you're in class, because you're learning something, right? That's what they're doing when going to these things. It's like, do you consider that your free time? <laughs> right, right. And so I think we've, we, we have a misperception, which is what you started with, of what play really is, right? What, what 
what the definition of play is. And I always say in leadership and advocacy classes that I teach at the grad level, I always say, give your definition because everybody's is different, right? Mm -hmm. it, it always looks different. What does it mean to you when I say children need to play? Right. What does that look like to you? And and their definitions are all over the map. You Absolutely. know, they like, it is for our researchers, too. We have, you know, we have a certain thing we've held on to, but people pull out certain things that they're, you know, more interested in. But yeah, and yeah. it depends on the context, too. It does. Absolutely depends on the context. So when we think about having directors or teachers put up that first principle, in their classrooms and reflecting on, you know, how the morning went and did I follow the code, how the afternoon went or what could I do differently tomorrow? I think that's the growth opportunity that we give them to and, recognize. And is there a pattern to when I find myself not able to follow it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like, like does nap time trigger something? Snack mm -hmm. time, all those transition me times. Is that when I find myself more quick to violate some of the code? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have found that most often when teachers are having a hard time, either teaching a lesson or just guidance, it's typically because they're trying to go against development. Mm -hmm. They're Absolutely. trying to go against the things that we already know about children. And it's like, well, wow, nothing's going to happen good about that for you or for the kids. You know, first graders want to be first at everything. So give them, you know, so then they're like, well, no, nobody's going to be first. It's like, well, then everybody's upset. Give them opportunities to be first, you know. Understanding development helps with that so much. And that's a big part of play, play, guidance. It all, it all goes together. It does. It, well, it's interrelated and interdependent, right? That's what we I say a hundred billion times in a classroom. And, and when we think about, uh, you know, Bruce Perry calls it a mismatch, right? Our expectations are in, in not in alignment with development. So there's a mismatch between what the adult expects and what the child is capable of doing. And that doesn't mean the child is developmentally behind or ahead. It just means this child, there's a mismatch between what you're expecting versus where they are. And so I think that helping teachers see that as well, that are you mismatching what you're expecting with where they are developmentally is well, helpful. Here, I was just, I was gonna say, here's something that might shake up your expectations a little bit. <laughs> There's a study that came out that was saying that preschoolers have the physical endurance of or the energy level of endurance athletes. Uh-huh. They need to move. And then there's then they're like you want them to sit. Uh-huh. And but you also want them to be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> pick one. Pick you want yeah, them pick to one. move and be healthy, but you know the things that kids like to play like tag. Oh my goodness. Have you ever played tag recently as an adult? Like Unfortunately, I do because my kids, it's like their favorite game. We have 70 million different versions of tag. But when, when I would when I was teaching um play as development, we would actually, I would go, we would my class would play the different games. So we'd go out and play tag. Gosh, even the like athletes, like <laughs> I even had somebody who was a soccer player. I'm like, soccer player, you're running all the time. She goes, No, not as much as this. Like tag, <laughs> you are running. And it's like uh -huh. You take those things away from the kid. That's how they were staying healthy, healthy as they were getting to play and be physical. Then they come and sit down. They don't want to move. <laughs> They're like, okay, it's my break. I can listen to you now. Like, I, I, you know, there is research that says, you know, students do better before recess and after recess because exactly. the before, like they know they're getting a break. Yeah. Like, what if mm -hmm. when you were in a, at work, and your boss is like, hey, depending on how well your classroom behaves today and how well you're doing, um, that depends on whether you get your, your 15 minute break. Oh, I know. How would Isn't you that feel? Awful? How yeah. would you oh. feel? It would it's just be an awful feeling. You give children freedom 
when they mm-hmm. know that they get that break. They're looking forward to that break. Y'all do it too in presentations. You're ready. You're with or lessons or classrooms. You're looking forward to that little break. Then you can come back and pay attention. So it helps yeah. you in both. Oh, well, I only I have to focus that, this much longer. Then I get a break. Right. And then I get a break. And that that good presenter say that. We're going to do three more slides and then we're going to take a break. And people go, you can just see them go, oh, oh good. Yeah. I, I need a break. I need to walk away from this for a little bit. Right. And but so, I can do uh, that. I can do three more. Okay. I can uh-huh. give you that. And that, that's probably why we see that children can do better on tasks right before recess and mm-hmm. after. And right after. Instead of having, you have to stay in to complete your worksheet. Right, because right, you but if they know the that there's a chance that they're gonna not be able to go out, and they have anxiety. You know what anxiety does? Uh-huh. Makes them Shut harder them to work. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. And, and so I really, I really think this has been amazing because we needed to get refocused on the importance of what we do and what our ethical responsibility is to children, and and that it almost needs to be in our face all the time, right? It needs to be present and in our face. And we need to constantly be referring to it and reflecting on it. What did I do today? And what could I do differently tomorrow to be better at this? Because no one's going to be perfect. I mean, I remember days when I was not perfect, right? I remember weeks when I was not perfect. (laughs) And, And so we have to just strive to do our best every day. So Joanna, thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to close this out and then we'll be right back. Well, thank you guys so, for thank you. getting me all excited yes, here talking this was, about this. I know it's really exciting. Um, so thanks for uh, coming with us, Joanna. This was amazing. So to learn more about Porch Play Chats and IPA USA, please go to our website and click on ipausa.org. And I hope you'll join us. And until next time, keep on playing. Thanks. Bye-bye.